Good morning. This is Michael Hayden talking to you from the conference on palmitylation being held in Oxford on August the 22nd to the 24th. My talk and my input to this conference has been to discuss the role of palmitylation in the pathogenesis of Huntington disease. Huntington disease is this really very devastating disease that has impact in midlife and at the present time there is no way to interrupt in the course of the illness and no way to modify this particular disease. So it's invariably fatal and the tragedy of this condition is that every child of an affected person has a one in two chance of inheriting this mutant gene. We've been very interested in trying to understand the pathogenesis of HD and the pathways that we know are most important are those that are influenced by the actual mutation underlying HD, and that's a poly-Q expansion beyond the range of 36. One of those pathways is, in fact, palmitylation. HIP-14 was the first identified 10 years ago in 2002. It's now DHHC-17. And it was identified in a yeast to hybrid screen for Huntington interactors. But what was most important is that HIP-14, in fact, has significant modulation in terms of its interaction with Huntington's. And this is modulated by the size of the mutation in the mutant protein. With increasing size of the protein, there's less interaction. Also, HIP-14 is part of a gene family, a unique gene family out of all the palmitol transferases for which there are 23. This has a unique anchor and repeat which binds to particular substrates at uh, six transmembrane domains and also a classic active a catalytic DHHC domain in both HIP-14 and HIP-14-like. HIP-14-like was originally described in the first paper because it had around 50% sequence homology to HIP-14 and was closest also in the nature of the structure and topology of this particular protein. HIP-14-L, just like HIP-14, the interaction with mutant Huntington is also reduced, as you can see here, where when you look both for HIP-14 as the control here and HIP-14-L, there's a significant reduction in interaction with mutant Huntington in the presence of polyglutamine expansion. And you can see the levels of Huntington are normal, but the level of interaction is significantly reduced. We've been trying to focus on the role of HIP-14. We know its influence, the interaction is influenced by CAG expansion, the function in the central nervous system. Remarkably, mice that have targeted disruption of HIP-14 have many features similar to Huntington disease. In particular, most notable is they have loss of the characteristic selective area that's involved in Huntington disease, the striatal volume, there's loss in that as seen here, one, three months and 12 months. And also associated with that, there's significant decrease in striatal neuronal counts. What's different to Huntington disease is in fact that these mice have this at birth, essentially early on in development, whereas Huntington disease is a late onset disease. In contrast, when we've looked at the HIP-14 like a mice who had targeted disruption. What you see here, and if you look on the right, it's striatal volume in particular, you can see that at one month the striatal volume is normal. But what you see over time is that in fact striatal volume loss is progressive, very similar to Huntington disease, and associated with that there's also striatal neuronal loss. So both of these models have characteristic neuropathology, uh, motor abnormalities, by neurochemical abnormalities that really replicate remarkably and exquisitely Huntington disease. And this highlighted for us that not only is the decreased interaction with HIP-14 and HIP-14-like in the presence of the mutation, but the question is, is HIP-14 and HIP-14 actually dis like dysfunctional? And does there, in the presence of the mutation, is this having some reminiscent or some replication of what's seen in HIP-14 or HIP-14-like mice who have complete absent of the protein? In an effort to try and define these pathways, we've now been involved in trying to detect the full substrate and the full spectrum of numerous substrates involved with HIP-14. Just as an example, if you look at these number of interactions from public sources, BIND, Biogrid, HPRT, look at Huntington disease, HTT, 
And then look at HIP-14, remarkable paucity. And so we've been involved in the yeast to hybrid screen using, this is an automated hybrid screen with 17,000 cDNAs, collaboration with Eric Vanka using different baits. The baits here cover different parts of HIP-14, the Ankerin repeats in particular, but all the way going, all the way out to the catalytic site. And we'd be able to identify a large number of interactors. The challenge now is trying to define which of these can be confirmed in mammalian interaction assays and which of them have features that might be important in pathways of Huntington's. Which of them are the putative substrates that might be palmitylated? Which of them are HD relevant because they're implicated in pathways that are already engaged and involved in HD? Which of them are involved in trafficking? We know that HIP-14 and HIP-14-like are important palmitol transferase that regulate trafficking of proteins in cells. Which of them are regulators that may play a role? HIP-14 has significant homology to a yeast casing kinase. Which of these may have kinases or phosphatases or other factors that may be regulating the function of these T proteins? Which of these also are polyproline binding? Because this may also further identify proteins that are interacting with Huntington as many polyproline, Huntington is a polyproline protein. And you can see here that we initially had 79 genes that met some of these criteria. 45 are now confirmed. And we've gone on to show that some of these interactors may in fact be extremely relevant to the pathogenesis of Huntington disease. And this will be work that is forthcoming. So this particular work has been done by important and wonderful graduate students in the lab. And it's my pleasure to share some of these thoughts with you today.